Now, when considering this, there you need acceptance essentially from four stakeholder groups, the regulators. And the state of California's regulator for Ford Ord is Roman Rocca. And he is actually the chair of a team that I serve on with the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, which is essentially promoting this technology. But as Roman told me, actually as recently as this morning, make sure people understand what the limitations are, that it's a good technology, but it doesn't work everywhere. But I would expect if there's appropriate places at Ford Ord to implement this, that the regulators would be positive. Uh, we found from community groups across the country that community groups like the idea of less disruption and less destruction for a technology that's just as safe. But the community people do want to know, of course, that the people doing the work are competent and reliable. They don't, you know, the fact that the, the scientists could do it in laboratory conditions doesn't guarantee that it'll work right in the field. Make sure it's done by the right people in the right way. Um, Industry, that's been sort of interesting. You know, a lot of the companies that do ordinance uh, removal are small, fly, almost fly-by-night firms. They just hire technicians and go from place to place. And those firms aren't that happy about this technology. But there are some major companies in the field that have the money to invest, to buy the metal mapper, and are able to do this work in the field today. It's not, uh, it's, this isn't a future technology. It is a current technology that's available once somebody decides to do it. Perhaps the biggest obstacle in many parts of the country comes from the Army and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, some of the key people behind this technology are from the Army Corps of Engineers. But if you're familiar with the Army Corps of Engineers, you know, I've spoken at uh, their conferences and they have a little castle in the corner of my PowerPoint slides. Well, that castle is an indication that the Army Corps of Engineers is actually a feudal organization, F-E-U-D-A-L. <laughs> and, and they have all these fiefdoms. So the fact that the technology experts for unexploded ordnance think this is good technology doesn't mean that the Army contracting officers with jurisdiction for a, any particular site are going to be happy with it. Because it, there's a risk to doing things differently than you've always done them before. And so this is perhaps the biggest uh, obstacle to implementing the technology is to convince people within the Army bureaucracy and the Army Corps of Engineers to try something new. Uh, they're worried that the regulators won't like it and the community won't like it and industry won't like it. My experience is the, big, the people who are least likely to want to move to something new are some of the people within the Army bu Corps bureaucracy. So that's really what I have to present today. Uh, it's, this is a technology I'd like to see considered here. It's got a lot of promise, but I, I say considered. Anytime you make a decision to clean up a site, whether it's the, the volatile organic compounds in the groundwater, uh, the PCBs in the soil, the contamination in the landfill, you take the technologies you have, you take the methodology you have, and you, figure, you, you in investigate your options and you decide what's best for your site. It's my belief that there are portions of Ford Ord for which geophysical classification will be cheaper, safer, faster, and better. Thank you. I want to thank FOR and CSUMB for having me. Um, the rest of us who came from Washington, we had our nice snowstorm on Sunday and more snow on Monday and ice and rain on Tuesday. So I'm very thrilled to be here. And it reminds me of the qualities of life that you have here in California. And as a person who works in the green building industry um, and, and hearing the talks about unique qualities and characteristics of this region and state, um, and seeing from Katie the lead certified buildings here, I'm always reminded of the qualities and values that seem to drive California, at least to the rest of us. So I think this is part of those sense of values of community and stewardship and environment. So I appreciate being a part of this symposium. Uh, I teach in architecture, and the sad story that we hear is architecture students do not read. 
Um, I'd like to say that I read, um, but unfortunately, they, maybe they don't, or we can't tell sometimes. So I like to use a lot of images. So I'm trying to use as many images as I can here. Um, I will throw in a few numbers as well. I always like to show this slide to my students um, because of its sort of contrary views of how to deal with environmental consumption and waste. And it's meant to be funny, and I think it's funny, but I think another point of it is there is no one perfect solution. We have the existing and we have issues of consumption and waste, um, but we do always build new and have new materials and we have to deal with trying to change the production systems as well. So do we help the environment by producing more green stuff or do we help the environment by retaining what we have, reusing what we have, and we just have to take each of those questions and apply them to the circumstances, such as here at Ford Ord, in each case, and as we can best make them work. I have my, my threes. You know, threes is a very powerful number, um, especially coming from Catholic universities. So that's... <laughs> and so what I like to talk about is Yes, we have a heritage and a legacy of, of, let's just say, not willful destruction, but just lack of knowledge and understanding. And again, Fort Ord is the case of that. So we have to deal with what we have, and we have to recover and remediate as best we can. Knowing what we know, and as we constantly learn, we also then have to take what we have and try to reconstitute it, recycle it, reuse it, try to put it back into use. So that's my second part of this, this cycle, I'll call it. And then last, we can go to the next level. What will buildings be in the future? What is the design today? And we can't know the future, but we can use our intelligence to design in a way to try to mitigate and actually avoid all these problems that we've created for ourselves in the past. So what will be new materials, new design techniques, to actually just eliminate this constant struggle with um, the unknowns and, the, and the, I'll call them mistakes that we've created for ourselves. So this is just a slide. I do different projects with my students. Um, in your upper right, you see a, a deconstruction project. So we work with um, dismantling old buildings, such as here at Fort Ord and different places, and recover the materials as best we can. Um, that deck is, we did an entry to the Solar Decathlon this year, which, gee whiz, every year it's been in Washington, D.C., until this year, the first time that Catholic entered, and it was in Irvine, California. So unfortunately, in a very unsustainable manner, we had to ship our home all the way across the, the country here to California. Um, but that material then went into that deck for that house, which um, I'm pleased to say went to a wounded veteran um, in the Southern California area. And then the last picture is a design from uh, Delft in Netherlands where they're very progressively looking at designing buildings to be adaptable and deconstructible and use materials which by themselves are not environmental hazards or difficult to reuse or recycle in the future. Benign materials um, and using uh, careful thinking. So I'm going to take that three part of recover, reuse, and redesign and a little bit talk about the past. I've been to Fort Ord before, um, approximately 10 years ago, when quite a large effort to look at the deconstruction of the wood frame buildings. And so a lot of effort went into that. But I show this picture not necessarily because of the re results, such as a million tons of this went somewhere or some economic development that took place, but because the opportunity that was presented there was to explore these techniques of deconstruction. And this knowledge has now actually gone quite a bit around the country. So the idea of panelizing or using different machinery was not really a practice that was used in this area of building deconstruction and materials recovery. But what Fort Ord provided to the people who worked on that project or a different series of projects was the opportunities to explore technology explore techniques. Um, there's been different um, encapsulation techniques, these different recycling techniques, which whatever the impact of that immediate 
opportunity, that knowledge is what's important, the generation of that knowledge and how that starts to change the industry across the country. And as we all know, you have these kind of conditions still existing um, as the, the slow and I guess now going to be much more rapid process of remediating the blight. But reuse takes work and recycling takes work. The environmental hazards, the lead-based paint, the asbestos that's embedded in these materials, as we know, are very difficult and costly to recover and also make these materials healthy again for reuse. But I'd like to point out, if you think about, um, for example, the U.S. Green Building Council as an agent of change in this country and internationally now, 10 years ago, there was no lead rating system. Um, GSA and, and primarily federal agencies adopted it. Those are tremendous markets for the products and services of green building. Now the U.S. Green Building Council projects by 2015 in the hundreds of millions of dollars of products and services in the industry driven by the demand for, in this case, green materials. So that work doesn't mean that in the future and as we grow and, and create these demands for green building and green products, those markets won't be realized. Sure, a lot of things take time, um, but the growth of just that particular industry, as thinking about California, um, Cal Green, and the different codes and standards that you have here, um, you're obviously one of the biggest markets for this whole way of thinking. You are unfortunately here at Ford Ord, you are sort of at the perfect storm of asbestos and lead-based paint. So this chart is very simplified, but to show the consumption of asbestos-containing materials in the United States in the 20th century and also um, lead-based lead paint materials. And the lead-based paint line is for residential uh, buildings. I don't have the data for commercial. So in the early part of the 20th century, almost every home had lead-based paint. And as you know, lead was discovered to be harmful a little earlier than asbestos, and asbestos, you know, caught up pretty quickly. But the, the, literally the peak of asbestos use in this country was right about the time that a lot of the buildings that were built here. Um, so unfortunately, you are left with this legacy of a lot of lead and a lot of asbestos. Fortunately, as you can see, that the trend has gone down in the outline of lead and asbestos and materials in this country, although there are still some products that can be imported. Um, we, we figured it out. But that's, that's, a, that's, that's a century. You know, that's an entire century from kind of start to finish that it took to go through that process of figuring it out. Maybe these aren't such good things to use in our building products or in our homes. So time is, you know, time is, is not essential, I guess I would say. Time should be taken as we understand it, that many things take a long time to change. The impact of building materials in this country, so in the U.S. economy, we had about 3.4 billion materials go through the economy. In 1900, about 90% of all materials used in this country were fiber-based or, quote, renewable materials from agricultural sources. In 2000, that was reversed. Only about 5% of building products used in this country came from renewable sources. So we primarily are driven by inorganic um, ores, aggregate sand, gravel, stone, iron, and so on. Those are the materials that we use now. None of those are renewable. And construction materials globally produce about 11% of CO2 emissions annually. And cement alone is about 7% of all global CO2 emissions, just the production of cement, which um, it is the most commonly used material um, in the world. But lately, just thinking more about the concrete buildings that you have here at um, Ford Ord, what does that mean for us? I mentioned lead and asbestos. Well, just because we had lead and asbestos doesn't mean we have a lot of other materials right now. There are probably hazardous materials, or could be or will be in the future, in this building. And you may have them in your home or in your clothing or many other places. We just haven't developed the knowledge and understanding of the impacts of those materials, um, the effects on human and ecological health. But we still use them with some lack of knowledge, or in some cases, wholly lack of knowledge as we go through our system. 
but I'm sure because you all are mostly from California, you know more than the rest of the country um, some of these words like vinyl chloride, pentachlorophenol, formaldehyde, and that those potentially will be the kinds of lead and asbestos of the future. And they are found all over um, in our homes and our, in our built environment. So we have to be thinking about these kind of materials as well in the present. We also have the waste that's generated from construction industry. And it's a little hard to see, but there's a red line um, which follows the coastline of the continental United States on this map of the United States. A structure the size of the Great Wall of China, the distance of that coastline of the continental United States, which is about 5,000 miles, is, that is the production of CND waste in this country every year. Basically, a Great Wall of China um, is built by the, what we waste in this country every single year. So, uh, you know, if you put it all together, we could start seeing it from space, perhaps. I think it's ironic that, you know, the Great Wall of China was not built as an architectural edifice. It was a defensive or utilitarian structure. But now we think it's some sort of beautiful, wonderful, iconic um, symbol. And who knows what can be found in Fort Ord that can also represent um, that kind of iconic free and history um, that didn't really start out that way or intend to be that way. And so the last, this sort of pedagogy, and I apologize because I teach, so I have to give you, give you my lessons here. Um, a great author, Alan Durning, wrote a book, Secret Life of Everyday Stuff. And what he found was the average products produced in the U.S. economy take about 16 times more raw material that ends up in the product. So we call that an ecological rucksack, or it's like a backpack, an invisible burden that the average product would carry around. That's all the stuff that came from the ground to make that product that you do not see at the end result, is not contained in the end result. So the benefits of recycling and reuse are not just that thing. They're not just this thing. There's 16 times this notebook that is preserved and avoided in terms of new production from the reuse of this notebook or the recycling potentially. So when you think about retaining what we have, and in fact the best benefit is substitution for new and raw materials, um, there's an incredible benefit to doing that environmentally. And we're always struggling to find those um, economic benefits, which has been mentioned, we don't well price or cost um, in U.S. society. So these are just examples of rucksack, or the factor overburden of raw materials times the end product. So for example, aluminum takes 85 times more mass of raw material to make one unit of aluminum. Cement, not so bad, takes three times the raw material extracted to make the one unit of cement. You can see more benign materials like wood, then the burden isn't quite so extreme. Okay, so I'm making my case, I hope. Why are buildings demolished? In a study done by Athena Institute a few years back in Minneapolis, they looked at three years of just random building demolitions in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And lo and behold, they found actually most buildings are not demolished because some structural failure or some other kind of inherent condition of the building itself. Most buildings are demolished because they're unsuitable for use or unable to an economically adapt to a new use. And land use development or abandonment because of other kinds of economic factors. And I also like to point out buildings are not designed to be adapted um, or to change use very well. So this is the reality. I, I would think of myself as an environmentalist but I also look at this as the reality, that buildings are not demolished because we hate them or they fall down. They're demolished because they just don't work anymore. And we have to deal with changes of land use, changes of function, aesthetics, style, all the factors that are the qualities of a building that we can then think about um, in terms of what we need now, what we may have and what we need in the future. 
So back to the imagery and for architecture students. So this is just a simple example of an old concrete barn that was turned into a beautiful modern home by hollowing out and leaving the exterior walls and inserting this aesthetically pleasing, perfectly modern, functional um, house while retaining the character of these old walls. It's just saying, you know what, I got this. What am I going to do? How can I be creative about retaining the, the structure of the shell um, while doing what needs to be done? A similar case, Savannah's College of Art and Design, taking an old, uh, I think it was a trolley kind of maintenance facility, old brick warehouse falling down, the bricks were falling off, and they built a new museum um, in some part of it, but they couldn't retain all of it. So they just built this creative, beautiful sort of structure, wall, enclosing this lawn, and put, you know, these sort of artful looking arrangement of chairs. And now they have this really interesting, evocative, outdoor exterior space that's part of their campus and retain some quality as much as they can of the historic infrastructure. Even down to simple things. So these are just concrete slabs taken up, oriented in a way to create a kind of wetlands mitigation, stormwater flow um, system and a wetlands restoration project. So they're actually able to use this material in tune with the environment to create the stormwater management system, slow down the flow of the water, allow it to filtrate, just using the raw material that they had from a salvage or sidewalk, I think it was. And the University of Colorado students taking just rubble and making what, what are called gabion blocks, the very large structures of wire cage and rubble for a farm building, but evocative and beautiful and turning the sort of, you know, the sort of pearl into something I should say it the other way around, right? It's like the pig and the pearl or whatever. I can never get that one right. And then just another very simple example, the ruins of a historic home, completing the wall which was abandoned and decayed into the actual structure and, and rectilinear structure that was needed for this enclosure. And then lastly, in East Germany, taking the old abandoned concrete um, cast and panelized housing projects. And this artist actually took two floors of one of these uh, concrete structures and made this outdoor sculpture garden. The furniture is actually concrete, so that's cast as a new material. Um, but it's the footprint that they've reconfigured um, in a completely different way, and I think it would create a completely different feeling or perspective for the people in that, those communities and those cities. Okay, and so very briefly, the future. Um, this is adapted from a, a wonderful man, Malcolm Wells, who um, was a very quiet man. He was never known, I think, nationally as one of the founders of green building movement in the latter 20th century, but I, I feel he was. He just wasn't um, given the credit that he might have deserved. And so he has this very simple idea of a checklist for sustainable building. And I give this to you because just to think about the possibilities when we do get very bound up on how much does this cost? How long does it take? You know, what's the problem? What, what are the issues? What is this and that? Or we can say, what do we want? And what is the vision? And what is the kind of hopeful perspective that we want to go for? And sure, I, you know, I'm old enough to know it's not going to be that easy and that you have many difficult issues. I deal in the economics of salvaging and so on. Um, but unless you have these kind of visions that I think most people would agree with, that a sustainable building, for example, to create clean water, clean air, um, to use recycled materials, to use daylight, um, to create that kind of quality um, of life and, and econ economics as well, the kind of green economics, um, most people, I think, could agree on that. And most importantly, it's beautiful. So. If you drive towards what's beautiful, um, more people are probably going to go with you in that journey. One of the really unique opportunities, I think, here is the idea of research and technology. And actually, the recycling and abatement and all of those things that go into buildings, whether you run out of buildings or not, as I mentioned in the very beginning, it's the knowledge that's generated that actually can change a whole industry of recycling and demolition. 
And who's going to go out and build their own, you know, 5,000 abandoned buildings? Um, well, unfortunately, places like Detroit have those. And I'm working in Detroit with a group that's trying to develop better techniques. But you have an amazing opportunity to take advantage of this infrastructure to generate knowledge about how to do this, that everyone would want to know. Anyone dealing with these legacies want to know. And Ford Order has already done that in the past. So these are these crazy little robots that some guy figured out. They're not real. It's a con concept. And they run around, and they eat the concrete off the wall, and they churn it up into a little rubble, and then they stick it in those bags over there on the other side of the picture. And you have pre-bagged aggregate that this little robot generated for you. Um, and it's all about the technology and how this person thought about creating this tool. I do this research on the economics and the values and all that sort of thing about recycling and reuse. Well, OK, so what? You know, if I just go out and we figure out how to do one building or two buildings or three buildings. Um, but what you're trying to do is create, again, this kind of infrastructure of knowledge and education. So for example, now we're working with building information modeling. So how can we take Revit, which is the, the main drawing tool for architects, and embed some of this knowledge in the building information modeling drawing tools as they draw buildings or perhaps you're going to do a renovation. You draw the existing building, you're going to draw the changes, and you embed knowledge about um, cost, benefits, values of material, cost of doing the different techniques, and so on. Wow, now you've automated the design process with hard knowledge that can facilitate the cost effective while still doing the design part of that project. Um, in the tools that architects typically use, all architects use, AutoCAD, uh, Revit, and so on. And then my last sort of um, prospect to you is this idea that we've designed things that we found out not to be such a good idea. So in the future, can we design to be more adaptable and deconstructible? A big part of that is the materials, the connections, the systems that go into those projects. But it's taking a new approach. Instead of saying, the design is the design, it fits the function that I've determined in the first place. But I think of what other functions this building may serve. What is the function, not the object? What is the service that's being provided, the qualities and potential qualities that are needed for other uses? So if I look at, as you do, or you might hear in the future, projects that may go from housing to the laboratory or to the office space or to other functions, how can they actually be mutable in that way? Thereby, of course, avoiding demolition, avoiding waste, avoiding um, these downsides of cost and, and sort of the agony that you have to go through to make change. So this is based upon Stuart Brand, a famous Californian, um, and his idea of designing for scenarios. So we don't design for static first use, but we design for scenarios in the future. And so this amazing building, this is actually a three-story building that was built in a parking lot um, ahead of time, so to speak, before it was even placed on the site where it was going to end up. So this entire building was built in modules designed to be shipped down the road to be disassembled after it was completed here, but then, of course, could be disassembled in the future, and the most high-quality methods possible. So it's off-site construction where there's no immediate financial or other pressures. The weather is not a, a problem, although this one's outside. They course